So thank you everyone. Um, as, as I was introduced, I'm the food safety or one of the food safety extension specialists uh, in Athens. My focus is produce safety. So a lot of you may have heard me talking about um, food safety in particular, but I'm also going to talk a little bit today about um, the coronavirus, kind of where we are in the current situation, uh, especially since we're, we're kind of in harvest season for a lot of commodities and, and how how some places are kind of handling that. Um, obviously citrus has a little bit of time before we need to, to worry about that. Um, but kind of jumping into worker training, which was is the focus of this um, as far as food safety and, and coronavirus both. Um, worker training is required pretty much across the board uh, by, by your buyers, uh, by your regulators, um, by your auditors if you have any of those. For any of your workers that will ever come in direct contact with the produce itself or with any surfaces that might contact the produce. So our food contact surfaces um, in a facility, this would be, you know, your, your sorting tables, um, any bins for harvest crews. This would be like the, the bags that they're harvesting fruit into. And this needs to happen anytime a worker is hired. Um, so if you're kind of hiring people throughout the season um, or throughout the year, you're going to have to have a training for each individual person who comes in if you can't do a big group training all together. So when they start, this needs to be updated annually and it needs to be obviously in a language that they understand. So if you have a large workforce that predominantly speaks Spanish, um, you need to make sure that you offer a training in Spanish and I'll, I'll let you know. This is something that we're actually working on right now. We've partnered with, um, with NC State because they have a really good trainer who speaks Spanish. Um, if, you, if you have issues like that, we can try to help you out with offering this training. When you, when you do that, make sure that you keep good training records uh, in case you get audited or in case a, um, a Georgia Department of Agriculture inspector comes through. Uh, these records will need to include every employee's name, the date they were trained, or the date their training was updated, and, and who did the training. And so when I'm discussing this training, kind of the big things you need to hit on for food safety, um, just kind of the general principles of food safety. So when I say that, um, uh, just kind of what some of our, our normal pathogens are, what they do, where they come from. So we know like animal feces um, can introduce contamination to, to produce, to food, and make people sick. Um, if that contamination is in water, that water can be spread to produce. We know this. Um, you might need to update this, this training with your workers. So if they notice that, hey, there's some cows in our irrigation pond that aren't supposed to be there, and we're worried about fecal material going from the pond um, to the crop itself, these, these are things that you're, um, are useful if you have more workers in the field who are aware of this. Health and hygiene, I'll probably mention hand washing several times, but um, also just, you know, having good bathroom habits, uh, making sure people wash their hands after using the bathroom, after going on breaks, that your employees show up in clean clothing, um, that boots aren't muddy or covered in animal manure if they're coming in from somewhere else. Uh, recognizing the symptoms of foodborne illness, so we have this pleasant little diagram across the bottom of my slide here. Um, kind of the basics that we associate with foodborne diseases are uh, fever, um, cramps or nausea, um, diarrhea or vomiting. So make sure that your workers are aware of these, that they can recognize them in themselves and other workers and that they know if they have any of these symptoms, they don't need to be coming to work because they can contaminate produce, they can contaminate things that will make their coworkers sick and cause issues there. Um, and also make sure that there's, there's good information available to your workers on how to communicate um, the risks of foodborne disease to supervisors. So if there are signs of animal intrusion in a field um, and, and they think there might be contamination from animals defecating on something, um, if there's a problem with the water supply, they, they um, see something that might impact well quality or something like that, uh, make sure that they know it is their responsibility to report this to supervisors um, and, and make sure that there's some incentive for them to report it to supervisors. So uh, sometimes it can be easy to spot a problem and 
maybe hope someone else deals with it. So make sure that there's some incentive for your employees to be communicating effectively with, with management and with you. So some of this training will kind of be specific according to where people are working. So your harvest crew, make sure they have good hand hygiene. The um, citrus, they're handling just about every piece of fruit as it comes off the tree. So they need to be washing with soap and water for 20 seconds um, on a regular basis. They're not required to wear gloves. If they do wear gloves, they need to be kept in sanitary conditions. So this you know, includes changing them out frequently. Um, if, if someone goes to the bathroom and decides to wear gloves when they go, which needs to be discouraged, they need to know that now their gloves are contaminated. Same if they decide to take the trash out. Um, gloves need to be changed and kept clean and hands washed regularly and before putting on gloves. Uh, with harvest bags, if they're used, or harvest bins or buckets or anything that you're using that you're putting produce into, these should never be placed on the ground. Um, you get contamination from the soil. Uh, if these bags or bins are used to dump, um, dump the produce that's collected in them into a bigger container, you now have dirt on the outside of your bag or your bin and it gets dumped in and, and touches um, other fruit that gets added uh, added to that bigger, bigger pile. So if, you know, someone takes a break, make sure they, they know, you know, bags get hung up on a hook or on a tree if they're taking a break in the middle of the field. Um, and also make sure that harvest bags, bins, um, anything that might touch fruit is a part of, or is included in the cleaning and sanitizing program. So these, these need to be regularly cleaned. Harvest crew also needs to be informed that any fruit that touches the ground, um, if it's not something that is grown on the ground, so in citrus, generally our, our oranges uh, aren't touching, touching the soil, um, this fruit must not be harvested. Now it's, it's different if you're growing things like squash or cucumbers um, that are grown on the ground, but if it's, a, if it's a commodity that is not supposed to touch the ground, if someone drops a piece of produce, um, or if a branch is hanging low and the fruit on it is touching the ground, that should not be harvested. And that is, um, uh, that is covered in the Code of Fe Federal Regulations in, in 21 CFR. So that is actually a regulation in the produce safety rule if you are covered by the produce safety rule. You can harvest it and eat it yourself. Um, if you drop something on the ground, you can eat it. The, the FDA isn't worried about that, but you can't sell it. You'll also have, I'm going a little ahead, different training for your packing crew. If you have a designated um, group working in the packing house or in some sort of processing facility. So again, hand hygiene. Anyone who's near the product or any surfaces that touch the product um, need to be aware how to properly wash their hands and how to do it frequently. Um, hygienic zoning. So when we discuss this, we just mean that there's different, there are different things you need to take into account uh, when you're handling or when you're near your food contact surfaces, which in food manufacturing, these are often referred to as zone one. You might have, you might have heard that terminology before. Um, so you'll need to kind of have more strict cleaning and sanitation protocols for your food contact surfaces than your non-food contact surfaces. So um, your brushes, your sorting tables, your conveyors, where you're directly touching fruit, those will need more strict um, cleaning and sanitation programs in place than some of your non-contact like the floors um, or areas where we're not expecting the produce to directly contact. And again, um, kind of to refresh with sanitation, although I know a lot of people on this call are already familiar with this, you, anytime you want to use a sanitizer, and when I say sanitizer, I mean things like chlorine or peroxyacetic acid or, or Lysol or really anything that is meant to kill microorganisms, you can only apply those to a clean surface. So if you have dirt on a surface and you apply chlorine to it or you apply peroxyacetic acid to it, the dirt will just absorb all of that and those chemicals aren't available to then kill the microorganisms that are on the surface. So you have to clean your surfaces, remove any dirt, any oil, uh, any film that might interfere 
uh, with your chemical that you'll be applying. Allow that chemical to have proper contact time so you can't just spray it on and then immediately rinse it off. These need 30 seconds to sometimes a couple minutes to contact that clean surface to get a good thorough kill um, for the microorganisms on, on the surface. Make sure your cleaning crews are aware of this and also make sure that they're using the correct chemical. So um, you can't use a chemical that's not allowed for use on food contact surfaces. So uh, I mentioned Lysol. I don't think Lysol is approved for use, at least for food industry, on food contact surfaces. Um, that could be used on, on other zones, but you might not want to put that on your food contact surfaces where you would rather use chlorine or peroxyacetic acid since we are allowed to use those. So uh, I know I'm kind of the food safety extension specialist and when Joshua reached out to me, he asked me to discuss food safety. My role has kind of changed a little bit this year with the, with the pandemic going on because um, there really isn't uh, much, many other people in the way of extension to discuss coronavirus. And now in the food industry, um, that's become a, a big concern, obviously, uh, as it's a concern with everyone. So kind of the difference with this is with, with food safety, we're really worried about making the consumer sick. So you don't want a foodborne pathogen to make it on an orange or on another piece of produce um, to a consumer and, and cause an outbreak because that would be a huge economic loss in that way and you don't want to make people sick. Well, with coronavirus, we've changed a little bit because we're not worried about someone with coronavirus coughing on an orange and it going into commerce and making someone sick that way. That's not very likely. We don't think coronavirus um, is foodborne yet, although we're still learning about it. Uh, what we're worried about here is you get one sick person on your harvest crew or your, in your packing group. Um, they make everyone sick and then all of a sudden you're gonna be mid harvest um, and, and you lose your entire workforce. So kind of the difference now is you're really trying to protect your workers so um, they stay healthy and so you still have people who are able to, to do the work you need done. One thing I try to encourage people to remember too is I, I know there's a lot of frustration um, because the CDC um, government has have kind of gone back and forth on a lot of the recommendations and I, I think it's it's made people very distrustful of some of the information they're getting about the pandemic because the opinions have changed. Um, if you hear a changing opinion coming from the CDC or a changing idea, please try to keep in mind this is a virus that's only really been in existence that we know of for the past seven months. So generally with things like the seasonal flu, um, we've known about the flu for decades, for, for um, over a hundred years. We've had a lot of time to do that research. With this, there have only been seven months of study that we've based all of our decisions on. Um, so try not to become too disillusioned with the scientific community when you hear information change. It's just, um, we're, we're in an unprecedented time where we're dealing with something that we have very little research on and we're kind of having to learn as we go. So with the current state of the pandemic, I was looking this morning and, and got the numbers. Um, I think nationwide, our, our death rate and our hospitalization rate seems to be going down slightly, but it's not in Georgia, unfortunately. So with 120,000 cases, we still have um, about over 13,000 hospitalizations as of this morning, and over 3,000 deaths in Georgia. So we still have a relatively high mortality rate and a, um, over 10% hospitalization rate. So it is a very significant disease, even if you're hearing reports that um, some of our treatments are getting better. Um, there, there is promising news about it, but um, in Georgia, we're not seeing some of the benefit of that yet, apparently. We also have to keep in mind, our mortality and our hospitalization numbers are on kind of a two to three week lag behind our case numbers. Um, this is due to reporting. This is due to the fact that someone might be sick for a week um, before they end up going to the hospital, and then they might spend another week in the hospital. Um, and if they don't recover, then we have that mortality data. That is going to be several weeks maybe after we get that positive case. Um, so while we, we have our 120,000 cases, those deaths and hospitalization numbers need to 
catch up to that. But I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom. Um, we're still learning about this. Our, our uh, treatments are getting better. And we are finding out that mask wearing and social distancing actually do work. So when we were briefly shut down, we did get decent control um, of the virus. Um, people have decided to start going on vacations, um, have kind of lacked some of the social distancing, and that's why we're kind of starting to see a bit of the spike. Um, and I know mask wearing is one of those things that there've been a lot of different opinions on, um, because that was something that CDC came out at first and said, we think it might be worse because you're touching around your face, you might increase your chance of, of getting an infection. And then they, they changed course on that. So your workforce, again, with coronavirus is gonna need the food safety training, but now they're going to need additional training to make sure that they're not bringing coronavirus to your place of work. So um, the little, these are actually two little eight and a half by 11 size um, posters that you can, you can get from our website for free and print them off. Both, we got them in English and Spanish. Um, so make sure that workers are trained to stay home if they're experiencing any of the symptoms of coronavirus. I think most people are familiar with what those are at this point. Hand washing, important with food safety, incredibly important with coronavirus. Um, if you want to have hand sanitizer available to people to use, that's fantastic, but remember hand sanitizer does not take the place of hand washing. If you can in your facility, or keep people six feet apart. Um, if you're harvest crews, this is probably a little easier. Um, this would include if you have a couple people who need to hop in a truck and go across the farm. Um, it might be safer to put someone in the truck bed or take two trucks or both people wear masks when they're in the truck or just try to limit how much contact people have with each other. And then we are seeing um, mask wearing is, is becoming very beneficial. And a lot of our farms, um, a lot of our work crews, and especially we're seeing with a lot of our, our H2A workers, they're very receptive to wearing masks. Um, they feel like it protects them. They feel like it protects um, others. So while it seems like it, it would be hot being out in the field and we all know it's, it's hot, we're seeing a lot of them prefer there being a mask rule um, for their protection. And so we do get a lot of questions on, you know, does this actually work? So masks really only work if everyone is wearing one. And I have this little graphic um, that I stole from, from Nebraska, and it just kind of shows that if, a, if someone with coronavirus has a mask on and someone without it also has a mask on, um, your risk is a lot lower versus only one of those individuals wearing a mask, um, as, especially as opposed to if, if neither one of them is wearing a mask. And this has a lot to do with the way the virus is spread in general. So the majority of our viral particles um, leave our bodies on droplets. So when we're talking, me in particular, I tend to spit a lot when I talk. Um, those droplets that I'm spitting tend to will carry viral particles if I am a carrier of the virus. It happens normally when you're breathing. Um, the cloth mask actually just captures those viral particles. And so there's been a lot of confusion because at first everyone was saying, you know, you need an N95 mask because that's the only thing that filters out the virus. Well, that is true if you just have free floating virus in the air. Um, but again, most of the viral particles that we probably encounter and walk through when we're exposed to other people are really spread through droplets in the air. So if those droplets don't have a chance to get in the air and a, a sick person is wearing a mask, they, they get caught around the sick person's uh, mouth and they don't have a chance to, to get into the air. And then those of us who are healthy don't have a chance to breathe that in. So a sick person wearing a mask we'll make sure that there are fewer vi virus containing droplets floating around the air, um, landing on surfaces that then you or I or whoever isn't sick yet um, won't come in contact with because they're on that person's mask. A healthy person wearing a mask, and when I say healthy, we know a lot of people can carry this without actually knowing that they're carrying the disease. So that's a concern. Um, but we also know a healthy person will be exposed to fewer droplets if everyone has one on. 
and their own mask may also work to filter out some of the droplets that are floating around in the air. So it benefits everyone, whether or not you're sick or healthy, um, to still wear a cloth mask, even though um, the virus is tiny and passes through, but the little droplets can be caught on that cloth. And what you're really trying to do is just reduce your exposure below the infectious dose. So if I'm wearing a cloth mask, I happened to breathe in a couple viral particles that were free floating that weren't on a droplet. Um, a couple viral particles may not be enough to get me sick. My immune system still might be able to take care of those because it's a smaller dose than if I just breathed in a bunch of droplets that had a large quantity of the virus in there. So just some common misconceptions too before I, I get off my soapbox. Um, I, I hear a lot of things, I see a lot of things. Um, posted. One is, you know, if I wear a mask, I'm getting ahead of myself again. If I wear a mask, um, I'm just breathing in the same germs. You know, I'm, I'm breathing in germs that are trapped inside the mask. Doesn't that, in, doesn't that make me sicker? Isn't that unhealthy? Well, if you're breathing those germs out, those are your own germs. Your body already knows how to recognize those. Your body already has those in check. You're not putting yourself at a greater risk because your body is already familiar with those bacteria, with those viruses, with whatever you are breathing in. Um, they're your germs, so, so own them. Um, you're, they're not going to make you sick if they're already residing in your body on a regular basis. Um, I've also seen people complain that wearing a mask won't let you build up your immune system. You have to keep in mind um, I've, I've hardly left my house um, in the past several months, but my house is still filled with bacteria, uh, with, with um, molds and yeast. Um, I have a dog running in and out of my house. The food I eat contains bacteria, contains organisms that my body has to deal with on a regular basis. They aren't normally things that make me sick, um, but they're things that challenge my immune system, that keep it in good shape, um, that, that keep it active. And so um, I, might, I might not be getting exposed to the virus, but that's kind of the point. I'm protecting myself, but my immune system is still very active, even though I'm, I'm encountering just bacteria that um, are endemic to my home. So my immune system is still in good shape, even though um, I'm not going out and about as much as normal. And then another thing I've seen people kind of mention are, you know, coronaviruses have been around forever. So this one really can't be that big of a deal. And people, people will get confused because they'll look on a, a Lysol label, especially as this pandemic was starting out, and they would already see that coronavirus was listed on it. Well, we know coronaviruses have been around forever. Um, there, are, there are coronaviruses that infect people and cause colds. There are coronaviruses that infect animals. Um, this is just a specific type of coronavirus that we have never seen before. And that's why it's so, so significant. And something to kind of keep in mind is, you know, uh, I have, we have these three vehicles here. So um, we have an F-150, we have um, a Mustang, we have a Focus. What, is, what, is, um, what do all these have in common? Well, they're all Ford vehicles, but they're all very different. So you wouldn't use a Mustang to do, for, to do farm work. Um, you probably wouldn't try to, try to use a Focus to impress a date, although uh, I've spent a lot of my life driving around a Focus. So, um, you know, these, these all are very different vehicles, but they're all Fords. Um, that's kind of what this coronavirus is like. So yes, we have many different types of coronaviruses, um, but while our bodies may be used to seeing the Ford Focus of the coronavirus or the Ford Mustang of the coronavirus. This new one is something we've never seen before. Um, so we don't know how to recognize it, even though our bodies have had to fight off different coronaviruses in the past. This one is very unique. So do make sure that your, your workers are trained to use masks, especially when social distancing isn't possible. So if you have a harvest crew that's not around each other, they might be able to get away without wearing masks when they're out in the field. But as soon as they're around people and can't maintain distance, um, they need to be wearing masks. Um, anytime they're in vehicles together, and make sure that they're trained on, on when to wear these, um, how to wear them, so over the nose, over the mouth, 
um, how to remove it. So they don't want to touch the, the front of their face when they remove it, but want to be careful to remove around the ears um, and then wash their hands afterwards and have a, a regular cleaning schedule. So wash them in detergent uh, at the end of, of every day before they wear them again to work. In case there are any viral par particles on the outside of that mask, um, that way they're not just recontam or contaminating themselves um, by mishandling a dirty mask. So I know I ran through a lot there. Um, here, here is my email if anyone has any other questions or has any questions for me, I'm happy to reply to emails. Also, if you, you can just Google our UGA extension COVID-19 resources um, page, you will find um, we have webinars on there, um, some that I've done. We have those posters that I've, I put up earlier um, for, for social distancing, for hand washing. Um, so any, any questions that you have either about food safety or managing your workforce um, during the pandemic, especially as we get closer to, to harvest um, this fall and winter, you're, you're more than welcome to reach out and get in touch with me. So Joshua? All right, uh, I think Dr. Dunn's got to leave us here. So uh, any questions for her, um, please feel free to, to uh, put it in the chat or if not, raise your hand and we can unmute you to, um, to ask questions. All right, I see Brenda, it looks like. All right, go on. Do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, oh. you're on mute again. Can oh. you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, in wearing uh, the disposable masks, what's the rule of, of re-wearing those type of uh, masks? I don't know that there's, there's much in the way of a rule. Um, you can't really clean it. Uh, so if you can, uh, if you can find a good way to clean them, honestly, when I I do have a bunch of disposable masks I use, sometimes <laughs> I'll leave them in the dash of my car and let the car kind of heat up, um, let the sunlight coming through the window kind of kill anything that might be on the surface. There's not a really good way to use detergent on them. Um, so ideally, they are disposable. If you can use a new one each time, that's preferred. Um, but sometimes you just run out of masks because you're using so many. So um, uh, I, I don't know if that answers it perfectly, but um, if you can wash it, that's preferred. We prefer cloth for the reason that you can wash it. Um, and we prefer you dispose it if you can. But if not, a hot car probably can, especially in South Georgia, can take care of a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, any more questions? Well, I just wanted to say, um, I appreciate you using the analogy as far as the coronavirus and the various Ford vehicles, because even now I'm still encountering people that, you know, it was, a, you know, I think I believe last year around here in Georgia was just about, about getting, getting the flu. It, it was real, it ran, a, it ran roughshod around the state. And some people are saying like, well, maybe that was the, the coronavirus right there and, and whatnot, and they're trying to parallel it to what's going on this year. And I'm like, I, I something tells me I don't think those are, I don't think those are uh, one and the same. But I just appreciate that analogy because I'm, I'm going to use that now. <laughs> I do. I do have a, uh, an issue. I do have a question here from. Um, mm -hmm. If an employee shows, well, two actually, if an employee shows symptoms and is sent home, how many days until they can come back? It's the first question. Okay, so um, an employee who, who has symptoms, um, who is diagnosed with coronavirus, um, if they go and get a positive test, um, they will need to wait um, that 14 day period. Um, and anyone, if you have a positive coronavirus person in your, in your facility, in your harvest crew, Anyone who contacts them is also going to need to get, undergo that 14-day quarantine. Um, now, there, there um, is guidance on if they go and they, they get a negative test, um, they are allowed to come back. And I'm, um, but I don't want to say the wrong number. So Joshua, I'm going to look up what the exact number is for that. I'm going to send it to you if you would 
if okay. you send it out to the group after, because I don't want to say it wrong. Gotcha. Okay. And then question number two, if uh -huh. someone shows typical symptoms, but tests negative, uh, still keep them home? Um, so I, if they test negative, um, are, we, are we saying, okay, so we're saying coronavirus symptoms. Um, if they test negative, it's going to kind of be the same as managing the flu in your facility. You still don't want someone at work who's going to spread the flu around and get everyone sick. Um, so if they get a negative test, then you have to assume that is um, uh, not coronavirus. Um, I would still wait several days before they came back to work. Um, and that I will also clarify when I look up the, the coronavirus symptom and if you will send that out. I saw you collected everyone's, everyone's email, so I'll give the exact days for that. Okay. As well. And also, will there be a different type of insurance needed to um, when, when with all this going on as far as employees and workers? I have no idea about that one, but that is a very good question. And that is a question um, you will need to, to go contact your, your current insurance provider mm -hmm. um, and, and figure out because it might depend on who is providing your insurance. That is the first time I've heard that question, and that is a very good one. Okay. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I'm just checking my phone just in case anyone had emailed me any more questions. I don't see any. But uh, if that's it, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Oliver, you go ahead and uh, get started, and we'll roll on to the next topic. Uh, let's see. All right, can everybody hear me and see the presentation? Yes. All right. Yes. So uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Oliver, and I am the fruit pathologist and extension specialist uh, at the University of Georgia based in Tifton. And I primarily work on diseases that affect fruit crops uh, in southern Georgia, uh, blueberries, blackberries, and citrus. And so for today's talk, I'm going to be talking about the identification and management of citrus diseases slides to go. Yep. And so um, first I'll talk about uh, citrus greening and the Asian citrus psyllid because this is one of the most important disease issues of citrus that I want to make you aware. Um, and also I'll talk about several other disease issues um, that do affect citrus production in Georgia or could potentially. Uh, I'll briefly um, mention how these uh, diseases are typically managed during a typical uh, season uh, relative to the time uh, of year. Uh, you might spray uh, fungicides for example for those. And uh, then I'll uh, briefly mention at the end um, some resources that UGA has made available um, to you regarding diagnostics and um, some uh, information about growing and producing citrus in Georgia. So first I'll talk about the symptoms and the distribution of citrus greening in the Asian citrus psyllid within Georgia. So uh, citrus greening, um, oops, sorry, citrus greening is the most significant disease of citrus worldwide. Uh, it's caused by a bacteria uh, named Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus, and uh, sometimes this will be abbreviated CLOS. Um, and it, this bacteria is moved from tree to tree by the Asian citrus psyllid, and this is um, sometimes abbreviated ACP. Um, the disease uh, is also called Huang Long Bing, which means yellow dragon disorder uh, in Chinese, where the disease was first identified. And this is sometimes abbreviated HLB. So there's a lot of acronyms here, and I may use HLB. Uh, interchangeably with citrus greening to refer to this disease uh, during this talk. Um, but this disease causes uh, fruit deformities and leaf yellowing and overall tree decline. Um, it's caused because the bacteria that causes the disease uh, lives in the phloem of the plant. And so since it um, disrupts um, the normal transport of uh, the vascular system within the plant, it'll disrupt uh, sugar transport. And since the sugars can't get where they need to go, whether it's to the fruit or to the leaves or to the roots, um, basically the, the plant will decline uh, after infection. So the earliest, uh, the early symptoms on the leaves are vein yellowing. And really the most diagnostic symptom of the disease is the symptom called blotchy model or this asymmetrical chlorosis. And so why is it called asymmetrical chlorosis? Well, it's a little easier to see that on the next slide. Um, but if you look at the image on your, on your left, um, this is a leaf of a, from a plant that's infected with uh, the citrus greening bacterium. And you can see that the, if you draw a line up the center of the leaf and you kind of mirror image it, 
um, you'll see that the, the oval on the left and the oval on the right are different colors because the chlorosis, the yellowing uh, on the leaf, um, doesn't match up from side to side. This is different than a situation where maybe your plant has a nutrient deficiency um, and it has yellowing due to just a, a nutrient or, or stress issue. And sometimes you're, uh, in this case, the two, you see the two ovals on the leaf on the right, if you kind of uh, folded them over or matched them up from side to side, um, these would be roughly um, similar. So they're, they're more symmetrical. And so that, uh, this asymmetrical chlorosis is one of the diagnostic symptoms of citrus green. So uh, fruit symptoms, uh, the fruit may be misshapen. Um, it may also um, ripen irregularly. So there may be a uh, green, uh, they may stay green at one end. And that's, again, the name citrus greening comes from that. Um, but they also, uh, ultimately, the problem with these fruit is that they will uh, taste salty and bitter it's because they will not have the levels of sugar that they need to taste sweet. And eventually this is, this is the uh, primary symptom of the disease that le leads to um, you know, these trees being taken out and uh, due to lack of productivity because nobody wants to taste citrus that's not sweet. That's why we love it. So um, this, is, this is one of the major symptoms of the disease on fruit. Um, on, the, on the whole tree, um, the early symptoms often can appear on a single shoot or a branch. And so it's, again, I mentioned it was named a yellow dragon disorder. And that's basically because the dragon kind of rears its ugly head in different parts of the tree. And you may have a part of the tree that's yellow now, and then eventually uh, that yellowing will spread, but it may just be a single shoot initially. Uh, eventually that'll spread to the tree. And on younger trees, it'll spread throughout the tree more quickly than an older tree that gets infected. Um, but eventually these, uh, the twigs will, will die back um, and the productivity will decline pretty sharply uh, within a few years after uh, symptoms are first noted. I will say on that that the symptoms aren't always noted right away. There is a lag period before you see these symptoms, so the tree can be infected for some amount of time um, before you'll actually see the, even the initial symptoms. So citrus greening, the history of citrus greening in Georgia briefly uh, really starts actually in Florida where the Asian citrus psyllid uh, first arrived in 1998 and then uh, HLB was confirmed in Florida back in 2005. Since that time, HLB spread throughout really all the citrus producing areas of the United States. It's been found in Louisiana, South Carolina, Texas, California, Alabama, and more recently in parts of Nevada and Arizona. Um, and HLB was first identified in Georgia in, uh, I believe it was two trees in someone's backyard in Savannah uh, back in 2008. And since at the time, Georgia had no significant citrus industry, uh, the entire state was placed under quarantine based on the discovery of these two trees. Uh, in 2016, however, um, in Camden County along the, along the coast of Georgia, uh, multiple additional trees um, in people's backyards, residential trees, were identified um, to be infected with HLB. So some of the symptoms we've seen, and these are all pictures that I've taken in, in South Georgia, um, we've seen, again, this asymmetrical chlorosis um, on, tree, on trees here um, in some parts of the state. And it you know, ranges from this asymmetrical chlorosis. And even if you look at the bottom left picture, sometimes uh, it looks almost tiger striped, the leaves do. And so this is typical symptoms of, um, of HLB. So where, do, where is HLB in Georgia? Well, I mentioned uh, Savannah and I mentioned uh, Camden County. Um, and last year we did a small survey uh, where we looked at uh, 94 samples um, from the citrus trees throughout the uh, southern part of the state and all the counties that are shaded here. And we identified uh, eight uh, of the 94 trees to be uh, positive for the bacteria that causes HLB uh, from five sites. And so that adds um, Lowndes County, Pierce County, and Bryan County to our list of counties where HLB has been found. All of the positive trees um, that uh, we found last year were also in, where they were also residential trees. So they were in people's uh, back or side yards. And, um, Basically, we have not found uh, HLB in commercial plantings, um, but that doesn't mean it's not there, but in our surveys, we have not identified it. And so, so far, we've only found it in these residential trees. So HLB is certainly present in residential citrus trees within the coastal plain of Georgia. We know it's in these five counties, uh, and it's likely elsewhere where the Asian citrus psyllid has been identified, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the presence of HLB in residential citrus trees really does represent a threat to nearby commercial production, um, really because we think infected residential trees are going to bridge the gap between otherwise isolated commercial plantings. So our commercial plantings may be few and far between, but a lot of people across the southern part of the state have citrus trees in their backyards. 
Um, and so, and these are typically, you know, not managed in many cases. And so populations of the, uh, the vector could potentially build up uh, on infected trees and, and move out from there to uh, infect our commercial plantings. So really grower, commercial growers need to be vigilant, vigilantly, um, vigilantly monitoring new plantings for both HLB and the Asian citrus psyllid. So I, I mentioned I'd talk a little more about the Asian citrus psyllid. So this is one of the vectors of HLB. Um, it's the only vector that's present in the US. There's also an African uh, citrus psyllid that can vector HLB. Um, and this, but that's not present in the US. Um, this vector uh, persistently transmits the bacteria. So in other words, the bacteria actually multiplies within the psyllid. And it only takes about 15 to 30 minutes of feeding on, the, uh, on an infected tree for the uh, psyllid to pick up the bacteria. Um, and then it'll take about eight to 12 days after the bacteria replicates in the psyllid for the psyllid to be able to transmit um, the bacteria to new uh, trees. The psyllid can have multiple life cycles uh, per year. You can have nine to 10 generations. Um, and uh, cold temperatures will kill the egg and the nymph stages of the uh, psyllid. And the adult psyllid will suffer significant mortality if the temperatures get significantly below freezing. So for example, at 23 Fahrenheit, for more than seven hours, 95% of the adults uh, will die. So freezing temperatures in a way are, are your friend as far as uh, reducing the population of the psyllid, but really some portion of these psyllids can hide and survive um, in, in even these very cold temperatures. Essentially anywhere that citrus can survive, some level of uh, psyllids can survive. And so freezing temperatures are not uh, a long-term, um, you know, eliminate this problem from, from Georgia. And as we experience, you know, warmer temperatures, uh, and we've had pretty warm winters the last few years, there's probably no significant mortality of adult psyllids um, experienced recently anyway. Um, so the adult psyllids can be recognized because they have this black coloration at the ends of their wings, and they feed in a very particular way. So they basically form a 45 degree angle with the leaf surface that they're feeding on. But these are very small, so this, these pictures all make them seem huge, but they're only about a sixth of an inch to a tenth of an inch in size. And the next picture on the next slide will kind of show a little bit how small they are. Um, but the other way to recognize the psyllids are at the nymph stage. They'll actually, um, they, the nymphs are usually found on the new flush, the very um, green, you know, uh, tissue that's present at the end of the, the growing tips of the, of the citrus uh, tree. And uh, these nymphs will produce this waxy secretion. And so you can see a lot of this white little stringy stuff um, in that uh, growing tips on the plants. And so you can recognize them that way as well. Um, so you can see this picture I was talking about, the psyllid is kind of in the center there feeding on that new flush and, and that's very, very small. So um, you, you can see them with the naked eye, but they're, they're very small to look for. They're not these large insects. It's maybe some of those other uh, images indicated. Um, but the Asian citrus psyllid in Georgia has been found in all the counties on this image shown in red. Surveys in the last two years have looked at all the shaded counties here and the psyllid has been found in at least one of those years in each of these counties, mostly along the coast, but also across the southern part of the state, and including in Lowndes County. So managing uh, citrus greening is the real problem with the issue. There's no good way to manage it. Um, whenever the disease has appeared, citrus production has been compromised and millions of trees have been lost. 80% um, of the citrus trees currently in Florida are estimated to be infected right now with the bacteria, and that's despite you know, attempts to manage the insect, um, through insecticide sprays and remove infected trees rapidly. And it's still estimated that about 80% of the trees are infected right now. Uh, since 2005, citrus production has declined in Florida by 60% and HLB has caused $4.5 billion in lost production. Um, there are some cultivars that have some more tolerance to citrus greening, so they can continue to produce palatable fruit uh, despite being infected. And one of these is sugar bell. Um, but there really are no known cultivars of citrus with resistance to HLB, so they can all become infected with the bacteria. Um, the best management for a place like Georgia, um, where we don't have a lot of HLB yet, is to prevent establishment of this disease. Um, what, some of the best ways to do this is basically not bring in infected trees or trees that may have the psyllid on them. So don't move plants from infested areas um, and don't get materials from infested states, which is really about every other state. Um, uh, that has citrus, um, unless they're from a USDA certified vendor. And so they'll have a little tag on them showing that they were produced in a way that um, should uh, dramatically reduce or eliminate the chances that they're coming in infected with HLB in the first place. Um, so citrus greening um, is one disease, but there are also other diseases that can impact citrus production in Georgia. And I'm gonna briefly go through each one of 
um, of several of those and talk about the symptoms and their options for management as well. So uh, this uh, list of diseases, most of these are fungal diseases. Um, the ones in bold, we've actually diagnosed on citrus in Georgia, um, but um, I'll mention a couple others that are present in Florida and I uh, want to want people to be aware of and on the lookout for because there's really no reason why they couldn't uh, cause disease here in Georgia. So I'll start with citrus scab. So citrus scab is caused by a fungus, uh, Elsinoe falsettii, and it infects a lot of different uh, varieties and types of citrus. It does not, however, affect sweet oranges. So it has not been a major problem in Florida where a lot of the, orange, the citrus that they grow is, are sweet oranges, um, but it does infect satsumas, which are one of the major um, groups of citrus that we grow here. Um, and there is a, of note, there is a sweet orange scab, which is a different fungal species that causes a very similar disease that has been found in Alabama. So um, if you see a citrus scab, it could be really on any citrus. Um, the scab affects fruit, leaves, and young shoots. And so you can see these warty growths um, on the leaves and on the surface of the fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's where the scab fungus survives. And the spores are produced there and they're spread uh, from these pustules uh, by rain splash. And so whenever there's water splashing through the canopy, it can spread the, this fungus around. So managing the disease really uh, focuses on uh, reducing the chances of, of rain splash of the spores by eliminating overhead irrigation um, during the period where the fruit is most susceptible. So the impact of this on the leaves, it can obviously cause disease on the leaves, but we're most concerned about the marketable item from a citrus tree, which is the actual fruit. And they're really only susceptible to scab during the first two months uh, after petal fall when they first start to form. Um, and so protection during that period by reducing overhead irrigation or applying uh, chemical fungicides can be important. If you have a lot of scab, an application in the late dormant timeframe may be important, um, but a petal fall and about three weeks after petal fall will protect that vulnerable period of the fruit. Um, some fungicides that are used in commercial production um, are listed here um, below. Mm -hmm. Disease that we've actually seen the most of really uh, as far as disease samples submitted uh, is anthracnose. Thankfully, it doesn't seem to be a major issue as far as uh, having a significant impact on citrus. It's caused by the fungus Colotoxicum gliosporoides and it, this colonizes really injured and senescent tissue of stressed trees, uh, can colonize you know, the trails left behind by leaf miners and that's where we see it often, um, but it causes these kind of gnarly looking brown spots um, on either leaves or fruit. And uh, these spores are also spread by rain splash, but generally this disease is not thought of as being very important because you need a lot of spores uh, to produce really damaging infections. And it's usually only on those trees that are already stressed out or have damage due to some other cause where you see really a lot of anthracnose. Um, so eliminating that stress um, can reduce uh, anthracnose. And if you need, um, if chemical controls are needed, uh, which is pretty rare really with anthracnose, copper fungicides or azoxystrobin can be used. But again, that's not typically needed. It's usually another cause. It's usually a stress that's ultimately leading to anthracnose or it's not really worth um, controlling because it's not causing a major problem uh, even when it is there. Um, so one important note though, there's a closely related species of fungus, um, Colotoxicum uh, acutatum, that can cause post-bloom fruit drop. Um, we haven't observed that yet in Georgia. We grow some different varieties, so that could be one reason, but that does cause an issue in Florida, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Uh, Phytophthora root rot uh, is another problem we've seen a lot of on uh, disease samples that get submitted to our diagnostic clinics. Um, we see uh, Phytophthora root rot, um, it generally, reduces the, uh, and causes damage to the fibrous or feeder roots. So you see the damaged roots and the, versus the healthy roots, there's just a lot less uh, root material there to take up water and nutrients for the plant. Uh, and so you get this yellowing and the leaves will eventually fall off and the plant can die from severe phytophthora root rot. But this, uh, this pathogen, uh, really its life cycle is tied to, to water uh, very closely. And so the spores that are produced by this pathogen, uh, we can actually swim and um, this can spread the pathogen from plant to plant. So you often see in uh, problems of the phytophthora root rot and really poorly drained sites or even the low areas within a site um, is where you'll see it first, although it can spread to other plants. Um, so planting in a swamp is a bad idea. Um, generally citrus falls under all those tree crops that they say don't like, they don't like wet feet. So um, water, you know, persistent water and moisture in the soil and near the, near the surface um, can cause spread of, of phytophthora and cause problems with root rot. So proper irrigation, ensuring, ensuring adequate drainage are important for managing root rot. 
Um, fun, as far as chemical controls, uh, methanoxum or ritamil and phosphonate fungicides are used uh, to manage phytophthora root rot in some cases. Um, and uh, there are other diseases besides root rot that are caused by Phytophthora. And in Florida, they actually have issues with something called brown rot of fruit. So I will mention that briefly, though we haven't seen that yet in Georgia. So brown rot of fruit is caused by uh, two different species of Phytophthora, uh, Nicotiana and Palmivora. And fruit infection in this case actually occurs when rain splashes the, the soil up onto the lower um, tree canopy. And uh, Usually infection is gonna be kind of near the, near the ground uh, because of this. However, um, palmi uh, Phytophthora palmivora can produce airborne spores and it can move further up into the trees. Uh, the symptoms of this usually, uh, usually are this rot of the fruit uh, and then the fruit will eventually drop. And then of course those fruit on the ground can become infected and produce more spores and the disease can continue. Um, field locations that are new to citrus, which is most of Southern Georgia, uh, are likely free of these species, though we did find recently that Phytophthora palmivora is, uh, can cause, is present and can cause disease in southern Georgia on figs. Um, so it probably could be here and can cause disease on citrus. We just haven't seen it yet. Um, again, proper irrigation practices and preventing fruit contact with the ground are really important. So, you know, um, basically pruning off lower branches to keep the fruit from draping too low um, towards the ground can be important um, or keeping the uh, drip line, and by that I mean the, the circle where when it rains, you know, it remains dry under the plant, that circle, uh, keeping that within and uh, underneath the tree canopy so that um, any bare soil that you may be, um, that it may be present there due to, you know, use of herbicides or things doesn't uh, allow for soil to splash up. So if there's grass along that drip line uh, uh, circle around the tree, um, that will keep the soil from splashing up and plants from becoming infected with uh, Phytophthora in the first place. Uh, chemical controls are the same as before I mentioned ph phosphonates and methanoxin. A uh, greasy spot we've seen a lot of as well. It causes kind of this gre greasy appearance to leaves. It causes a problem on the rind of the fruit as well. Um, and uh, the, this can be managed uh, primarily um, culturally um, through the fact that the spores are produced on leaf litter on the ground. So the leaves that ha are infected fall to the ground and then in April to June they release spores um, that can then infect the new leaves um, in our warm and humid you know, conditions here in Georgia. And so if you can rake those leaves out and remove that dead leaf litter, um, it can reduce uh, problems with greasy spot. Um, fungicide applications during that period, of, again, late summer, late spring, early summer, uh, can be important as well. Uh, melanose is another disease uh, that affects citrus and it, it's uh, an issue in Florida. We haven't specifically seen melanose in Georgia, but there's no reason why it couldn't be here. Um, it is a bigger problem on grapefruit than it is on other citrus varieties, but can infect a lot of different citrus varieties. Um, the symptoms include these very small spots and pustules on leaves and fruit. And spores are generally only produced on dead twigs, um, but they can, and then they spread by rain splash again, uh, as some of these other fungal diseases do. Um, but this is usually not a problem on young groves because there's not a lot of dead, you know, dead twigs present for this uh, fungus to reproduce on. And so the fact that we have a lot of young groves means we you know, have a low chance of having problems with melanose, but it could become a problem uh, as, as uh, groves continue to age, especially if we don't prune out the dead twigs um, where this uh, fungus can reproduce. Um, chemical controls, again, fungicide applications uh, can be important in the spring and summer, uh, especially on grapefruit, because um, again, they're more susceptible to greasy spot. Um, Moving on, I briefly want to mention, so when do these uh, disease issues cause problems? Um, so in thinking about a spray, possibly if you're a commercial grower developing a spray program, um, kind of the pre-bloom time frame uh, is when you would begin being concerned uh, with citrus scab, especially if citrus scab has been a problem in your planting in the past. Um, but towards petal fall, citrus scab and melanose are important uh, considerations in a management program, sprays for those. Uh, and then uh, and towards post-bloom, and to protect the fruit again when it's most susceptible to citrus scab during those first two months. And then in the early summer, greasy spot sprays um, and it will also help control melanose as well. And then towards the late summer and the fall is really when brown rot um, is, becomes a problem. That, that's when control is best targeted to that. As far as root rot goes, anytime the plant is actively growing, uh, treating the soil or spraying some of these uh, materials that can be sprayed uh, foliarly for Phytophthora root rot. Um, can be applied uh, to manage that issue. 
So uh, last, I'll leave you with the UGA citrus resources that we have, uh, make you aware of those. Um, there are several options if you have disease issues or disease questions um, where you can get a disease issue diagnosed. Um, we encourage all homeowners and commercial citrus producers in Georgia to first contact their UGA extension agent. And they can, uh, sometimes they can uh, scout out the problem and figure out what's going on, um, or they can help you submit a sample potentially if necessary to one of our diagnostic clinics. So the primary clinic for diagnosing citrus disease issues in Georgia is the diagnostic clinic in Athens. Um, we also have a, a nematode lab in Athens that can uh, look at nematode uh, issues um, affecting citrus. And uh, we also have a diagnostic uh, laboratory in Tifton. And this is a fee-for-service lab um, that runs more specialized testing for things like viruses and bacteria. Um, and uh, speaking a little more about the plant diagnostic lab in Tifton, uh, Dr. Imran Ali is in charge of, of that lab. Um, and he can give you more information if you have more questions about the options they have available. But right now they, have, they do testing for citrus canker and HLB. Um, and I'll talk more about HOB in a moment, the testing options they have. Uh, and also recently, especially targeted at our, our nursery producers, but, but other growers might be interested in this as well. They, they've developed a battery of tests for different viruses and viroids. And I believe the cost currently per sample is $300 because these are all very specialized tests, but they can test for any of these 10 viruses and viroids that can affect uh, citrus. Um, uh, one last thing about HLB testing. Um, Last year, we got a grant from the USDA Specialty Crop Block Grant Program um, to conduct a survey for citrus greening within Georgia. Um, and through this program, up to 25 samples per year can be submitted for free testing from each South Georgia county. Um, we, plan to start, we planned to start that in March of this year, but there were other plans for March of this year. And so uh, instead, uh, we've had to delay that. And so we're hoping in September, um, we'll be able to reinitiate that testing program um, and test citrus samples for this effort. So if you have, um, if you're a commercial grower or a residential grower um, and you're interested in, you have some suspect trees um, that you'd like tested, um, contact your UGA cooperative extension agent um, or myself and we can talk about um, how to submit samples and how that process would work. But um, we do want to make growers aware of that and, and if you have suspect trees, we don't want costs to be a reason why they don't get tested. So let, let us know if you, or if you suspect HLB in, in your backyard or in your commercial planting. Uh, last thing, Citrus Blog um, is, uh, this is a website we developed last fall and it has uh, several links to UGA extension publications relevant to Citrus. And we're also trying to update it with um, research updates and news updates. I think the most recent update to that um, was from uh, Jake Price. He put some information about the results from their rootstock trial. So uh, we'll try to keep that updated, um, but it also includes a lot of helpful links regarding you know, uh, citrus production and diagnostic um, tools that are available for citrus in Georgia. And with that, I'd be happy if there's any time left to take questions. All right, any questions for uh, Dr. Oliver? And I see we still got some food safety questions in the chat. If, um, Dr. Dunn, are you still there? I'm still here. All right, good deal. But we'll go with the diseases and um, come circle back around to the, um, the food safety questions, all right? Yeah. I, see a question. I see a question from Jake, I think, uh, to me in the chat, and I'll, I'll answer that publicly. Uh, I think it's a private question. He says, how, how have you, have there been any other figs with Phytophthora? So far, it's only the ones we found in Lowndes County uh, last, last year. I think you identified them originally. And uh, those are the only ones we've seen uh, with this Phytophthora palmivora. But the same species, again, does cause disease on citrus. And so it could be, it could be elsewhere. Um, and we could see it on citrus eventually. All right, uh, if there is any, I'm not seeing any hand raises. We'll check the phone. I don't have any emails from you all. We'll go we'll circle back around to Dr. Dunn. Um, Dr. Dunn, you had questions about any understanding of the virus survival on fruit or vegetables off the ground. Uh, and I guess we're saying coronavirus survival on. Mm -hmm. on fruit and vegetables. So, um, I mean, off the ground, you, you can't, you can't harvest things off the ground anyway, um, or at least to, to turn around and sell. Um, so as far as viral coronavirus survival, though, on 
fruit surfaces in general. Um, we don't really have any data on that yet. Um, right now, the, the current assumption is that it is not a foodborne disease. Uh, I hesitate to, to, I guess, rely on that exactly, just because um, we do see viral particles that are, are shed in the feces of people who are, who are sickened. Um, so we do know that the virus can pass through the GI tract, um, but so far we don't think that you can get it from eating fruits and vegetables. Um, also, my guess would be coronavirus, unlike a lot of our foodborne pathogens, um, especially things like E. coli, salmonella are really good at attaching to the fruit surface. Um, that's why we don't harvest things off the ground, because if there's E. coli on the ground, you get an orange on the ground. Um, now, the E. coli can stick on there and really no amount of sanitizer you apply to that orange and no amount of brushing will remove it. Um, coronavirus doesn't have the, the benefit of being able to attach firmly to the fruit or produce surface. Um, and so the washing process in general may be enough to, to take that off. Um, it's also why we're kind of telling people since, since we don't have a lot of information, you know, if you go to the grocery store, you buy fresh produce, um, that's still safe to eat. I have been eating the same amount of produce, which I eat a lot of produce, um, still eating the same amount. I just make sure every time I handle any food packaging or anytime I, I handle any produce I have to peel, I just wash my hands afterwards um, in case, you know, there was a sick worker and, and somehow the virus made it through the store and made it into my home. Um, but I'm kind of of the opinion. I, I think that's a long shot. It's not anything I'm too concerned about, but a good, again, good, good hand hygiene. Um, your, go ahead, ask. Oh, oh I, I didn't know we finished with that, answering that. <laughs> I was, you were about to ask the next question, weren't you? Yes, um, someone, I got it, another question was, uh, let me grow back up. Um, that they've been told that if they go three days with the, with no symptoms, they can be around people without infecting them. I'm assuming this is COVID nineteen related as well. Yep, yep. And I believe this person is correct. I okay. uh, I I went through and I found um, a publication that I actually wrote um, a few weeks ago, but it's it'd been long enough and I've slept enough times I forgot the information in it. Um, but the questions about employees returning to work. Um, so what we, um, what I think the CDC um, outlined was an employee who tests positive for COVID-19 is, can return to work if they have gone um, 72 hours or, or three days without the aid of, of medications to alleviate their symptoms. So if they've been symptom, symptom free, that, that three days um, is when they can return as long as that is no sooner than 10 days after the appearance of the first initial symptoms. Um, so when they, when they develop that cough, they need to wait 10 days from when they first developed the cough and three days from when they last had symptoms. Um, also what they can do instead of that three days is they can get, they can get COVID tested two times and if they have two tests in a row that are negative, if they are taken at least 24 hours apart. Um, so if you go and get COVID tested on Monday, it's negative. You go and get COVID tested again on Wednesday, it's also negative. We have at least 24 hours between that. Um, then they are allowed to go to work after that. Um, employees who test positive um, but had no symptoms can return to work um, no sooner than 10 days after their last positive COVID test. So, you know, this is someone who may never have been sick, but they went and got tested just because they were worried they may have been exposed to it. Their test is positive. They need to wait 10 days um, after that positive COVID test because they don't have that, that three day buffer from when symptoms stopped because they never had symptoms. Um, this employee also can um, go back and get tested two more times 
And again, if those tests are taken 24 hours apart, are both negative, they can also use that um, as their measure for when they can go back to work. Um, and I kind of mentioned this before, but if you, if you have someone who shows up sick, uh, they expose um, a, most of your crew or a certain amount of people who happen to be at work that day, um, the potentially exposed people who don't develop symptoms will need to self-isolate for 14 days before they can return to work. Um, so hopefully that answers those questions. And what I've done is I found the publication um, that we wrote that into. It's actually for poultry processing plants, um, but it's based just on the CDC's discontinuation of isolation for people with uh, COVID. And so the, the same parameters, and those are on page three of that document, uh, the same parameters will apply to anyone in the produce industry. So don't be turned off by it saying poultry processing. And you, 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 you've emailed me that information. I can email it out to the group. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. If there's one more question for Dr. Oliver and uh, Dr. Dunn, got a few housekeeping things to uh, take care of. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oliver and Dr. Dunn, for speaking to the group today. I'm going uh, to launch a poll right now. If y'all don't mind uh, participating in it and uh, just answering a few questions. And also, if I don't have your information as far as getting your, uh, the pesticide credit for this on or the CEUs for this particular recording, um, please 